This is the Internet Report, where we uncover what's working and what's breaking on the Internet and why. Before we get into the headlines today, stay tuned to listen to Jason Black, who is the head of global network infrastructure at Uber Technologies. Jason's joining us later on in the show to talk about how Uber builds cloud applications for resiliency and redundancy. On to the headlines right now. Yeah, the big story from last week was clearly the T-Mobile outage. This is a very large mobile carrier, third largest in the United States, and they were impacted on Monday of last week, June 15th, for nearly 10 hours. So this affected their LTE network, and uh, there was a lot of chatter on social media about it, and even the FCC stated that this was simply unacceptable, that uh, a service like T-Mobile would be down for for that period of time. We're going to cover a little bit more about the T-Mobile outage in our under the hood section. But other than the T-Mobile outage, there was a little bit of chatter going on about WhatsApp as well. And this was on Friday, June 19th. Although the service faced no disruption in terms of, you know, actually communicating with people, uh, there was a glitch apparently um, that blocked their privacy settings or you had issues and kind of, you know, updating your privacy settings. Um, unclear why this caused any, any stir because it not, did not really affect um, the actual platform itself, but still it made it up to social media. Yeah, and there was a, some other news related to messaging applications. Mm-hmm. There was uh, uh, Russia lifted its ban on Telegram, right? This would right a couple of years. Yeah, so um, Russia has some strict, you know, um, anti-terrorism laws that requires um, messaging services to actually provide um, the authorities with the ability to decrypt decrypt messages. And Telegram actually um, refused to do that or were non-compliant to that because of which they faced the ban, um, I believe, in April of 2018. And um, as of last week, Russia lifts that ban on Telegram. Uh, which is good to know because in spite of the ban, people were finding different ways to actually use Telegram um, either through VPN services and so on. Great, yeah, so we're just gonna go straight into a, a little bit of a deeper dive on the T-Mobile outage uh, last week. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier, this affected the LTE portion of their network. And so, um, you know, just to kind of quickly cover what we, we saw during this period, which was, um, you know, we had some tests that were um, going through their uh, network backbone, and they were all fine, right? So mm-hmm. they they were not impacted by this outage. So it was really just the um, voice data calls that were impacted, right? Right, right, exactly. Um, and and a few of us, you know, have T-Mobile. Um, that that's our service provider for phone, and we noticed that. Um, We couldn't obviously make any phone calls um, over their LTE network. Uh, We couldn't send any text messages either. Um, However, we were able to use T-Mobile's LTE service to, you know, um, know, use Slack or any other type of um, data services. Now, um, it turns out that, you know, T-Mobile did come up with the root cause where they said there was a fiber outage that kind of overwhelmed a very critical piece of their LTE infrastructure called the IMS core. Um, and, and just to kind of create, a, provide a little bit of perspective there as to um, how a mobile network looks like. This is kind of, you know, a really high level um, version of what a mobile network look like looks like. And if you're connecting over LTE, you're kind of coming in from this EU TRAN piece all the way passing through what's called an evolved packet core or which is a packet switch network going all the way through the internet. Now that only is the case if you're um, dealing with data, which is say you're on LTE and you're using Slack or any other kind of, you know, um, data services. However, if you're making a voice call over this network, you're kind of hitting what's the IMS core, which is really critical in terms of the signaling component of a voice call or a text message. And according to T-Mobile, this was the piece of the network and infrastructure that was overwhelmed because of a fiber cut, which kind of explains why we couldn't necessarily make any uh, phone calls over um, LTE or even send text messages over LTE. It's interesting, um, sort of uh, reminds me of the Comcast outage a couple of years ago where 
there was uh, there were two fiber cuts actually, and and the result of that was that it severed um, parts of its control plane. And so they had connectivity in, in one part of the country and separately in another, but because their control plane was impacted, it had a really uh, huge impact. Um, right. And it, you know, so, so fiber cuts, if, it, if, it's, um, if it's impacting the really critical part of the infrastructure, and obviously the control plane is sort of the head, yeah. uh, then it can have a pretty massive impact. So it is, you know, it, you know, it's plausible, um, their explanation in terms of the fiber cut potentially impacting a really critical part of their infrastructure, and then in turn that can have a cascading effect. Although, you know, it's, it's interesting that there wouldn't be more redundancy. In the case of the Comcast outage, um, they apparently there was a fiber cut that was still being in the process of being uh, kind of addressed, and then they had a second fiber cut. So they were, they were still with the first one it was the second one so it's going to be interesting to see was there is this an example where there should have been more resiliency um in place um but we don't have the full story obviously right we don't and and based on um t-mobile's you know root cause they did express that they should have more res resiliency not just on the fiber piece of it but also on the ims um core infrastructure and that's something they mentioned that they're going to be working on Great. All right. Um, so, you know, you sat down with uh, Jason Black of Uber. I'm really excited to hear your interview with him. Yeah. Um, up next, you know, Jason's going to be talking about, you know, how to design apps in the cloud, especially because a lot of the outages that we have been seeing over the past few weeks, you know, like the IBM cloud outage a couple of weeks ago um, was kind of an external third party that was disrupting um, applications in the cloud. So Jason has some really interesting perspectives on how should you think about redundancy, what does Uber do and, and things like that. So up next is Jason Black from Uber. Welcome to the Expert Spotlight. This week we have Jason Black. Jason's the head of global network infrastructure at Uber Technologies and covers data center, backbone, pops, and the cloud for the production and advanced technology group networks within Uber. He is a technology and business visionary with hands-on experience in growing multi-billion dollar web scale companies as well as his uh, previous startups. Jason, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So Jason, the first line of, you know, why, why it was interesting to have you on the show was kind of related um, in terms of some of the outages that we've been seeing recently, right? Last week on the show, we unpacked um, IBM Cloud's outage, which was caused by an external network provider flooding routes into IBM's network. Now, a lot of these outages um, on the cloud and the internet cannot be prevented, right? And in a way, it's, it's kind of the price you pay for agility and convenience of the cloud. So what should enterprises do to protect themselves from some, if not all of the outages when deploying applications at the cloud? Good question. So just as a company would think about redundancy and resiliency for their on-prem environments, the same considerations should be made for their cloud environments. Mm -hmm. uh, a company or a services should always avoid vendor lockup by way of you know, spinning up services that can be replicated in other cloud providers or on-prem. Uh, this is certainly easier said than done, as you would imagine, uh, yeah. given that each cloud provider offers slightly different offerings, but uh, it should still be kept in mind when making these decisions. Right. And, and are you, does that indicate multi-cloud is, is a best practice then? Uh, I think it really comes down to what you're looking for within your application stack and where you need things. Uh, certain things like database, you know, certain databases can be had in uh, one cloud provider and they can be had in another, but they might be slightly different service offerings that you may or may not need and want. And you would also want to consider how you're going to uh, strategize that with on-prem. Right. If you ever have to fail out, you have to be able to support that business model. So, Jason, how do some of these, you know, redundancy and resiliency best practices uh, factor into services that Uber builds? So, Uber has a tripod strategy, which is publicly known. You can go out there and Google it. Yeah. Uh, but how we do this is kept a little bit closer to the vest, as you might imagine. Absolutely. So, 
Yeah, having said that, I can state, as previously mentioned, that Uber always looks to avoid being single-threaded to either on-prem or cloud. What does that mean? So the way that we look at things and we expect that our cloud providers do the same is to have multiple availability zones in multiple regions. So where we may appear to have uh, what would be single-threaded be mm -hmm. between having, say, our data lake in an on-prem environment, we don't just have it in one, one zone or one region. We have it across okay. multiple zones and multiple regions. So the, and the same thing is what we would expect in, in our cloud providers. So we talk about uh, front-end SSL termination so that the app can terminate to the cloud. We would expect that if that service were to fail, that they would have a redundancy or resiliency model to allow us to continue that service within the cloud. Okay. However, if it doesn't, then we have a backup option for that, which is our on-prem. Got it. Okay. So if I had to like um, unpack this uh, and kind of visually structure this, you have multi-cloud environments. So that's one level of redundancy that comes into play. Within cloud, you rely on, um, you know, the, the redundancy options they provide, which is availability zones and regions. So if a cloud region fails, you switch over to another cloud region. Correct. But then you go one step further and then your own data centers are also created the same way wherein they have the concept of availability zones and regions. So you kind of um, almost have redundancy at every layer uh, possible. That is correct. So if we had to like, you know, walk through a scenario of an outage, for instance, wherein, um, and, and I think you alluded to this, like the SSL service, which is kind of the front end uh, where a user would uh, come to, uh, if that on the cloud service fails, you try to go to another region, but then if both your, or your, all those regions are out for some reason, what does the workflow look like? And I guess more importantly, how does this affect the end user? Sure. So um, just going back, if you're referring to the, the cloud provider not being able to provide that SSL termination yeah. for us, yeah. uh, our application has been built for that type of awareness. And uh, this failure still would allow for our application to be self-aware yep. and go ahead and make a direct call to our data centers. And that would alleviate having that front end terminate to the cloud. All of this is completely transparent to the end user and happens within milliseconds. So our application goes ahead and does that, those initial calls to the cloud. Right. And then immediately when it sees that it's not answering, straight to the data center. To kind of bypass the cloud itself if there is Absolutely. Nothing. Okay, that's awesome. And then um, the, the reverse of that, where your cloud's working okay, but you know, your data center and the redundancy there fails for some reason, how does that impact any workflow? Well, I'd like to think that we've done our best to design a network that's resilient to failure and taking into account having some sort of distribution and replication of workloads across our, our availability zones and our regions. But again, these type of failure outages remain uh, transparent to the end user. And it's, it's not really a flip of a switch per se. It's just it's application awareness. It's, um, it's just the way that our software stack has been built to be able to handle these types of failures or outages. So it's, it's, it goes not just at you know, the network and the infrastructure level, but also at the app level, um, there is correct. redundancy and resiliency built into it. That is correct. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, one final question, um, Jason, before we let you go is, um, you know, despite all this redundancy, resiliency, best practices that you have in place, um, what still keeps you up at night, right, when it comes to cloud deployments? Let's see, that's a great question. <laughs> So I think we've all heard the adage that your cloud is somebody else's computer, or in this case, data center, right? You should have center, that right? t-shirt. I have, actually, we have a t-shirt that says, your cloud runs on my network. I happen to have many of your t-shirts, <laughs> so, and I appreciate them all. <laughs> so, but, you know, most don't question what's going on in these data centers. We do our research as companies to try to know uh, what regions, you know, they're deployed in, what their zone diversity looks like. Right. And you want to assume that they're following best practices and they're, and they're being followed from monitoring all the way through the uh, triage of incidents. You know, I can only control what happens in my data center, but unfortunately I can't control what happens in others. So we have to, we have, to have faith in the way that things are being built both on-prem and in cloud. And as you alluded to before, you know, we are 
copying exactly what uh, best practices are for ourselves. Yep. And we assume that others are doing the same. So whether it's on-prem, cloud, uh, it should be a seamless interaction for the end user. Well, Jason, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a pleasure hosting you as always. Thanks, Archana and Jason. That was a great discussion. A lot of really great points, including the fact that um, most IT uh, Professionals today have to deal with a lot of infrastructure um, that underlies their services and they don't own much of it, you know, so you don't own um, service provider networks, you don't have control over it. Same thing with cloud networks and a lot of infrastructure. Again, if you're in the cloud, you don't own the underlying infrastructure, um, but you're still responsible for um, the performance of your service, um, the services you deliver. So um, there's some good lessons in there on, you know, still needing to understand and get eyes on, um, you know, all of the different pieces um, and all of the underlying dependencies for services that you're offering. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close out the show. Thanks for listening in. We, um, we have a great virtual summit, um, State of the Internet, coming up in a few weeks. The registration page for that event is now live. So you can go to thousandeyes.com slash events and sign up to attend. We have great speakers from Fastly, CenturyLink, Apnic, Akamai, and more. So really excited about that. And uh, of course, as always, if you have any questions, you want to offer any suggestions in terms of topics or speakers, you can drop us a note at um, internetreport at thousandeyes.com. And don't forget to hit subscribe and follow us on Twitter. With that, take care. Take care. <laughs>